if you can find a business that's related to the things that get you excited and it's related to things that you're passionate about and that you're great at, that's where you want to be. If you're a creative person, if you're a baker, a dancer, a photographer, a screenwriter, an actor, a comedian, a podcaster, and you want to figure out how to make a living doing what you love, this is the show. This is the show. Don't keep your day job. My name is Kathy Heller, and I'm a singer-songwriter. I make a living doing what I love, and I want that for you. This is the show that's going to help you do that and give you not only inspiration, but some real-life strategies. This is going to help you figure out how to take your creative passion and turn it into a profit. I want to say a huge thank you to Latote for supporting Don't Keep Your Day Job. You can get started for as low as $39 a month and enter promo code DREAMJOB to get 50% off your first month. So thank you, Latote. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Don't Keep Your Day Job. I'm so excited. We have Patrick McGinnis here today. He wrote a book called The 10% Entrepreneur, Living Your Startup Dream. I've just always been really impressed with what he's doing because he truly believes in entrepreneurs and he's trying to help you figure out how you can stay at your day job and slowly start to build your empire and slowly start to build the, a career out of what you're really passionate about. He went to Harvard. He's very bright. He's done tons of research and he has a great book. And I think he has a lot of hands-on practical advice that's going to help you take what it is that you're doing from your head and actually turn it into things that are real and take these ideas and turn them into real things and help you really have some practical tools to get clear about how to grow your business. So I'm really excited to have him on. I also want to go over some new things that are going on. I sent you guys packages. Some of you left us reviews. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another cool thing you guys can do is go onto Instagram and tag me at Kathy.Heller. Today, somebody posted some quotes that she loved that um, she wrote down that she learned from the podcast and it touched me so much. I loved it. And she tagged me in that photo. Thank you so much. So you can go to Instagram and talk about our show. That really, really helps us. It helps us keep making the show. So definitely keep spreading the word. We so, so appreciate it. You have no idea. I'm doing something new. Go to nodayjobs.com and find out, but I'm starting a new challenge and I'm going to start interviewing you. Those of you who follow this challenge, I'm going to pick several of you and talk to you on the show, which will give you amazing exposure, but it will also be awesome because you'll be inspiring so many people who are listening as you continue to dive in and follow your dreams. So go to nodayjobs.com, get the instructions, and um, I'll be picking several people to be on the show. Can't wait. I want to give a shout out to some of the people who sent me your work. I got so many different things. I got to look at illustrations and I got to read poetry and I got to read excerpts from plays and I got to see videos of people singing and doing stand up. And it was really fun to see that everybody really has a different calling and there was a multitude of various different crafts that people are pursuing. So I got so many and all of them were awesome, but I just want to talk about a few that really stood out to me. We have Lena Diedrichson, and she makes the most amazing cakes. She sent me a cake that is, um, she sent me a few, but she sent me a picture of a cake that was like a suitcase, and it says, happy birthday to our globe trotter, and then on top there was a globe, and it's all edible and amazing. And then the other cake she sent me was Cat in the Hat, and it says, oh, the places you'll go, and there's like this amazing Cat in the Hat. She's so, so talented, so thank you, Lena, for sending me that. Um, Jill Baker sent me her work, and she sent me photos of her calligraphy she just takes quotes and song lyrics that she loves and she makes beautiful art out of it so love that Eliza Capitan sent me really cool stuff she makes all kinds of things she's really crafty she sent me a picture of a necklace she made of a teapot she sent me some toys that she made um, and then she sent me sneakers that she painted and they're called magical unicorn feet and they're just adorable and I thought it was really out of the box and great um, Zach Morton sent me photos which I thought were beautiful he wants to be a adventure photographer and speaker and he sent me some beautiful shots of waterfalls and camping under the stars and all kinds of beautiful things uh, David Spencer sent me his illustrations they're gorgeous there's this little bear with a beehive and there's a little boy and they're so beautiful and colorful I really really enjoyed seeing his work he does all kinds of things and I know he's up late at night you know burning the midnight oil doing his art so it was beautiful to see it Tarn Susan Post he makes digital stop-motion art and I just love it. Love, love, love it. There's this beautiful um, stop motion uh, video he sent me of flowers being put into a vase. Just all kinds of different people doing all kinds of cool things. He's amazing. His Instagram is Tarn in a Barn, and um, I thought his stuff was awesome. 
Casey Latham sent me beautiful um, artwork that she makes. She says she does while she's inspired by music and all kinds of other things. She's a visual artist and she decided to seriously challenge herself to make 99 pieces in one year. And she's in her third round of 99 paintings in a year and she's starting to see some success. And she said the podcast is really encouraging her, but the artwork is beautiful. And um, Jimmy Cook sent me a video of him singing. He said he got cast in a show after listening to the podcast for the first time. And he just wanted to say thank you because he looks forward to the podcast every week. That is so, so cool. Lisa Schmidt sent me something amazing and it's called The Sober Hipster. She is launching this new thing where she's creating a tool to help women in recovery from substance abuse and addiction. It's art therapy in a box and she's gonna help people to heal by helping them do art therapy and it's very, very cool. Her website is soberhipster.com and when you go, it says the story box and she's soon launching something that is really gonna help everybody and I thought that was amazing how she's taking something creative and helping people in the process. One of my favorites that was sent in was by Constantine Del Rosario. She is a freelance fine artist and props designer. Her work is primarily of and on paper, but she works in all mediums. And she sent me amazing things. She sent me a chandelier, which is made of paper. And it was for the Huntington Botanical Library in Pasadena. And the second is an image size of Marie Antoinette, and it's made of paper. Uh, The wig as well as the dress is all made of paper. The whole pieces were used for a trade show in Las Vegas. She's incredible. You can look at her stuff at soloingdesign.squarespace.com. Her name is Constantine Del Rosario. She's unbelievable. The work is incredible and it's just amazing how everyone has a different talent. And that's what I mean. If you're feeling called to do something, not everybody else is gonna be doing it. And even if they are, they're not doing it in the same way that you are. Also, Caroline Stewart, I was really touched by this. Um, She said she's been continually inspired by the podcast and she's only 17 years old, but she sent me a play that she wrote called Leaving a Message After the Beep. And it's about a mom and daughter living together after years of being apart. The mom was a teen mom who couldn't afford a child at the time. So she sent her to live with her dad. And now the dad has chosen his new family over his daughter and she sent her back to live with her mom. And she said that the podcast is really helping her be inspired. But I was just so touched to read this excerpt of her play and she's only 17 and I thought it was really touching. It's just incredible. You guys are awesome. So what I was thinking, and by the way, I'm going to keep looking at the work that you guys send in and I'll keep choosing some favorites to talk about every week. What I was thinking is I want to challenge you, everybody who sent me in work, especially the people who I'm mentioning, but everyone who's sending me in work. I want to take this to the next level. What I want to do is I want to follow you. I want you guys to commit to taking some action. Listen to this podcast and I want to see who is actually taking the advice and taking the suggestions from what we're saying on the show and implementing them. And over the next few months, if you can email me and show me that you've been taking the steps and implementing things, I want to interview you. I want to have you on the show and I want to hear your successes and I want to hear how you're building this. So that should incentivize you even more. Not only are you going to do something that's going to make you happy because you're going to be doing what you love, but if you continue to listen to the podcast and you can email me over the next few months and show me how you are taking the steps and implementing what it is we're talking about and how you're seeing change in your life from actually committing and stepping up and implementing this, then I want to interview you. So so today is April 25th. I want to see how much you can do over the next three months. Um, If you're up for the challenge, then here is the mission if you so choose to accept it. Start to take notes and start to implement things from every week from the episodes and start to document and track what it is that you're doing, what you're learning on the podcast and how you're implementing that into your life. And get on my email list, go to nodayjobs.com and I will send you instructions. I want you guys to be a part of this challenge. But essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna start to implement some of the things that you're learning and you're gonna show me how you're doing it. And I'm gonna keep you accountable because a few times over the next three months, I will check in on you and see how you guys are progressing. And then I'll choose a few of you to actually have on the show and I'll interview on the show and you can show us what you've been doing and how you've been turning your passion into a profit and how you've been making your career come to life. And I cannot wait. So go to nodayjobs.com, sign up, and you guys can get into this program and we'll do a three-month challenge. And I want to start to see how you guys are implementing this. So please join uh, nodayjobs.com. I'll give you guys some instructions and I cannot wait to see what happens because I will be emailing you 
and following up and keeping you accountable. But I will also, at the end of this, um, I'll choose several people to have on the show and I'll interview you and that'll be some amazing advertising for you. But more than that, it's definitely something to keep you inspired and keep you accountable. And it doesn't have to mean that in three months time you made a million dollars or you know you, you quadrupled your sales. I just want to see that you're taking what we're talking about on the podcast and that you're able to implement these steps. And I want you to see that you're having some growth and you're moving forward. So I'm really, really excited about that. Thank you guys for sending in your work. I will continue to look through it. Those of you who left us reviews, Thank you so much. It helps us more than you know. I love doing the show. We have so many exciting guests coming up. Follow me on Instagram at kathy.heller. Uh, you'll see fun stuff that I'm posting. And check out our show notes. You can go to don'tkeepyourdayjob.com slash podcast, and you can see the show notes every week. Our producer, Emma Kikuchi, she does a great job of putting together all of the resources that people are talking about on the show. And there's really cool links in there. And anything that the podcast um, guests have talked about, she has it all in there. So um, even if you're not taking notes, all of it is there. You don't keep your day job.com slash podcast. And you can look through each episode and you'll see pictures and resources and notes and the key takeaways from every single episode. So check that out. Thanks to Lato for supporting our podcast. You can go to latote.com, that's L-E-T-O-T-E.com, and get started for as low as $39 a month and enter promo code DREAMJOB to get 50% off your first month. I'm so excited about Latote. So basically, it's a fashion subscription box that sends brand name clothing and accessories right to your door for one low monthly fee. They have the data to fit you better than any other retailer, so you can rent up to $700 worth of clothing from designer brands like Free People, Nike, Rebecca Minkoff, and more all month long. You can get as many toes as you want a month. You just simply wear it, and then you return, and you get to repeat it. It's really, really fun. You can fill out your style profile and sign up to get a custom tote delivered right to your door. You can wear what you want, return everything in the mail when you're done, and you'll get a new box within days. Whenever I go to a store and a salesperson comes over, I sometimes feel this pressure, like I have to buy something. And if I don't have a lot of time to try things on, then I get stuck where I'll I'll buy something even though I know in my gut I'm not totally sure I want it. So that's really frustrating. And I love that Latote is something I get to look at and spend time with. And then I get to try things and see if they work. And I don't have the pressure of committing to it. I get to buy the things that I wouldn't necessarily splurge on. So in this way, I'm playing and trying stuff. And it's like getting to walk into Kate Hudson's closet and just try stuff on. It's really fun. Again, that's latote.com and you can enter my code dreamjob and you can feel fabulous with fashion delivered right to your door. Now we're going to bring on Patrick. Patrick is the well-known author of The 10% Entrepreneur. It's published by Penguin Portfolio. He has also written articles for well-known publications such as Fortune, Business Insider, and Forbes. He's a graduate of Harvard Business School and Georgetown University, and he lives in New York City. He has so much good stuff to share, and I really want to dive in and get in your head, Patrick, and talk about this book you wrote, The 10% Entrepreneur, Live Your Startup Dream Without Quitting Your Day Job. So we're going to talk about that and see how you're able to start turning this into profit slowly until it's absolutely 100% blooming and then you can leave your day job. So let's see what he has to say. So Patrick, I'm so glad that you're here. It's so exciting because I know so many people love your book and there's tons of reviews on Amazon. So tell us why you were driven and passionate to write the 10% entrepreneur live your startup dream. So the reason I wrote this book was because I wanted to save everybody else from the heartache that I went through when I realized, <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Um, it's you, you, People write books either because, because they want to tell you how successful they were or they want to save you from making the mistakes that they did. Mm -hmm. And my number one sort of reason for doing this is because I realized I'd been doing things incorrectly and wanted to teach people what I'd done differently and hopefully help them not make the same mistake because I had worked in a corporate environment. So I had, I had never really thought about being an entrepreneur, to be honest. I was working corporate America and things were going great. And then one day my company, which was AIG during the 2008 financial crisis, AIG, which was a trillion dollar company, basically went bankrupt. Oh my God. Right. And so I, I got up one day, I went to the office, I looked at the stock chart and it was down, uh, the stock was down 97%. Oh my God. Right. I thought to myself, first of all, that's a bad day. Right. It's like, well, I guess I won't be, you know, sort of going on vacation this year. But then I thought to myself, what have I done wrong here? And what I realized in that moment was, number one, that we, a lot of us feel like we're on a very stable path. And, and, and if you look around the world, it's far less stable than we think it is. Something like half of the companies that were on the Fortune 500 in the year 2000 no longer exist. 
Wow. And and if you're in the creative world, and I've been a musician since I was a kid, but I also my brother is a jazz musician in, in New York City and plays in jazz clubs and, and on um, on Broadway, and he has lo- lots of freelancing gigs and things like that. I realized that it, it's not just the corporate world, obviously. Lots of people who are working on their own businesses or their creative endeavors also live with a lot of instability in their lives. Right. And and so what it, what came out of that for me anyway was how can you create something sustainable, but you also create autonomy for yourself so that you you are no you know so whatever happens in the economy or in your life you are the owner of something that will continue to grow and that will be yours right so that's all so exciting and i want to like sink my teeth into it so let's just start diving in and see as much as we can learn from you in this time so how do you do that What's the first thing that you start to talk about in your book? Let's put it together piece by piece. Where should we go first? Where I I would start is this. What I decided to do was I always, after that, I thought to myself, why don't I become an entrepreneur? I have lots of friends who are entrepreneurs. I I watch friends of mine build really valuable businesses. I, in fact, some, for example, some of my friends from business school went on and started Guilt Group, which became a major company. And I watch those examples. I think, I'm I'm thinking to myself, you know, why haven't I done this? You know, but then at the same time, I thought to myself, well, I'm not really sure what I want to do. And then I looked around and, you know, I can tell you lots of great stories like that. But the reality is being an entrepreneur is pretty hard. And a lot of times, more than often than not, you actually fail in being an entrepreneur. And so I thought to myself, well, I'm kind of afraid of doing that. But what if I was to combine the qualities of freelancing, the, 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 the idea of doing something on the side, with entrepreneurship and actually sort of be like a freelance entrepreneur. So that was the big idea I had. And then, you know, from that point on, and this can apply to anybody, whether you want to do a business or if you want to start something that's more creative, the big challenge was to say, well, what do I actually want to do? What should I spend my time on? How can I figure out what I should be doing? And that is the process that, and I spent a lot of time in this in the book, and it took me about a year to figure out. I, many of you will be much faster than me, I hope. But I really sat <laughs> I really sat sat down and thought, what am I good at and what am I passionate about? Because the things that I'm good at will allow me to be successful. And the passion will make sure that when I'm on, you know, it's Thursday night and maybe I want to watch a baseball game, yeah. I'm going to have the energy and the dedication to actually work on figuring out my business. Yeah, that's a really good point. So what happened was I got some really great advice from a friend of mine. And she is an executive recruiter at a one of these big firms in New York City. Uh-huh. And we were we were having lunch and she said, Well, what do you want to do, Patrick? And I basically listed out about fifty things. Right. <laughs> and she said, Let me give you some very sort of friendly advice. You sound completely unfocused. Why don't yeah. you spend some time thinking about what would make sense for you. And so what I decided to do was write a bio of myself, starting from about when I graduated from high school, of everything I had ever done and all the things that I had been involved with professionally and personally. Interesting. And then I, yeah, and I sat, and this is much harder. Everybody who who does this is in the book, and so when people read this uh, section of the book and do it, oftentimes they'll send me a copy of what they do, or oh, they'll cool. they'll email me and say, "This was really hard." Yeah. You know, you think it's going to be like an hour of your time and then like four days later, wow. um, you're sort of like, wow, McGinnis has really, um, re- really given me a lot of homework. But when you do that, two things happen. Number one is you remind yourself of all the things that you're good at and all the things that make you you and special and different. Number two is you start to see patterns. Mm-hmm. That that's kind of step one. Step two is a little bit more sort of outside the box. And what I call this exercise, I call opportunity cost zero with the idea that opportunity cost is is the cost of, of doing something different than today. It's that cost of switching over. What if you were to imagine that you go to work in the morning and the company you work for disappeared? They lock the doors. There's a big padlock and you have to start over and you can't go back there. What would you do? Yeah. And so that was the second piece is I sat back and I said, you know, if I didn't have this job, if I had never joined AIG and been through this whole thing and, and sort of gotten sucked into the treadmill that was that job, what would I have done? And for me, the answer was, well, I would have worked with entrepreneurs and I would have tried to build businesses in Latin America, which is really my passion. And mm-hmm. so as I combined my, my personal history, which was I had done all these things with technology and investing and things like that with my passion for Latin America, it was really clear to me that I needed to find things to do that had to 
do with those two things. And that's where I started. Wow. By the way, how did you fall in love with Latin America? When because I you were born in Maine, right? Is that yeah, right? So Maine you- is the is it's about it's about the farthest you can get from from Latin America. But when I was in college, I won a scholarship from the Rhodey Foundation, and I got a full year. And I'd never left the states before, so I remember getting on the plane, and I was in a panic. But when I got there, if you've ever been to Buenos Aires, it's basically one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And I just mm-hmm. thought to myself, that's it. I found the, my second home, and, and that was the beginning of a, a lifelong relationship with Latin America. Wow. So now you help people in Latin America to build businesses? Is that part of it? Yes, I do. What A lot of what I do is I help entrepreneurs from Latin America who are coming to the United States. Either I invest my own capital or I find capital for them. I help them to figure out their strategy. I help them to grow. Um, wow. That's where I started doing these things. Since then, it's really grown. I mean, now I've actually even invested in a play. Uh, so I've done some creative stuff too. Tell us about the creative stuff that you've invested in. Are, are there any Latin American businesses that were creative or on your own? Tell us about that, sure. including the play. Well, a lot of the early stage businesses are creative in nature because you're doing something entirely new. So one of my favorite uh, investments that I've made is a company that's actually based in LA. It's called Ipsy. Mm -hmm. And Ipsy is a company that uh, it's a monthly bag of makeup that is uh, that is sold. It's it's all done around YouTube celebrities, uh, the most famous of which is a woman named Michelle Fan. Mm hmm. And the founder of that company is, a, is an old friend of mine, and I got involved very early as an investor. But what I love about that business is, yeah, you think, well, it's an e-commerce company. That's fine. It's really much more than that. It's a community for people who are passionate about creating new things using makeup as expressing themselves artistically and, and through fashion and design. Let's go over a couple examples because it sounds like you really – you've been working with entrepreneurs. So for, I'm going to give you a couple case studies, and I just want you to like – brainstorm some ideas of what you would say to those people as if we're kind of giving people an inside, you know, they get to be a fly on the wall at like a session, right? So I'm going to make this up. I'm going to make up three things as if I'm coming to you as a, you know, you're going to consult. So let's say my name is Susie making this up and I decorate cakes, right? So I want to make a living being able to sell this. I want to be able to make cakes and sell them and scale it up just like the people who created sprinkles or Georgetown cupcakes or Magnolia Bakery. How do I do it? Okay, that's a great question, and I, I'm very partial to Georgetown cupcakes. Is Georgetown Hoya? So <laughs> I love them; they're delicious. Go they ahead. really are. So, what I would do, Su- thank you, Susie, for telling me right, about right. your your dreams. Um, so, the number one thing I would <laughs> tell <laughs> I would tell Susie is, first of all, there's one thing that that all of us really benefit from in today's world, and that's the fact that it's very inexpensive to build a brand and build a business online. So it used to be in, you know, 10 or 15 years ago that, well, there was no social media, first of all, but putting up a website cost thousands of dollars. Right. All the kinds of things you need to do to run a business today cost tons of money. Today, it's basically all free. Uh-huh. So the first thing I would say is, and I would encourage you, Susie, don't quit your job today. First mm-hmm. of all, figure out number one, if you actually like doing this full time. Part number two, Make sure your idea works because it, what would be so unfortunate is if you quit your job, you start doing this business, and maybe you have a really interesting idea. You know, I want to make gluten free cakes, or I want to make yeah. cakes that are, you know, ha- have some specific qualities that yeah. set them apart in the market. And the market doesn't accept your idea, or the market's too small for that idea. Right. Okay. Now, it is proven, there's some stats that come out of um, the University of Wisconsin, there's a great study that shows that people who start a business on the side and run it part-time before jumping in full-time are 50% more successful because they validate the business model. They make sure that things work before they throw everything into the company. But how do you do that? And I know this is like uh, the crux of you know a lot mm-hmm. of what you talk about. Yes. How do you do that? So, for example, for Susie, what I would do is I would get, I would go to Squarespace for two ninety nine a month. I put up a website. Mm-hmm. I come up with some sample cakes that I want to actually design. Mm-hmm. I would then do an email marketing campaign, a Facebook marketing campaign, things like that. Actually, test to see if I can find customers. And by the way, Facebook marketing is very inexpensive. Mm-hmm. And then I would get some orders in. I would build my product. I would figure out how people reacted to my product, get customer testimonials, and then I would continue advertising to see how much demand I can actually generate. And then once I had substantiated that there was demand for my product, that customers enjoyed my product, and that there was some word of mouth and demand coming on board, then I would say, okay, let's is great. Let's then look at how much am I making per cake? 
how much do I need to live? And can this business actually be enough to sustain me? And mm-hmm. if it is, then great, let's go full time. But until I know that, I don't want to jump in full time because the minute I jump in full time, I have the pressure to make enough money to live and I start digging into my savings and I put a lot of pressure on myself to succeed and businesses don't succeed overnight. They take time. And so by doing it on the side, I give myself the runway to test my idea, figure out what makes sense, have a real sense of what the numbers look like before I jump in full time. That's great. So how do you stand out if there's other people who are doing cakes? How do you stand out so that people start to want to buy from you in this Facebook marketing campaign and they want to uh, you know, order a cake from you versus the 50 other people that they've already heard of? Right. So I think that is part of the experimentation phase. If there's a great book that if you have not read it, I would even recommend it above the 10% entrepreneur. Um, okay. so, so that really means something. But yeah. it's called The Lean Startup and it's by Eric Ries. Okay. And it's a book about how to test ideas in a very low cost way. So one of the really great things about technology and the cheap technology we have everywhere is that you can very easily test different things. Go, uh, if you, for example, with Facebook ads, it's, it's really easy to run three different ads with different products on them and see which ones people click on. Yeah, yeah, true. And so as a result, what I would do, first of all, is I would think carefully Um, you can't build a product that's not authentic to who you are. So if you have a special recipe that's been in your family for 100 years and that's what you really want to do, then I wouldn't recommend that you go off and try to do something completely different uh, first because you want to try to do what you believe is the best idea. But you also want to test it in the market and you can do that cheaply and expensively build a prototype as it were I mean it prototype sounds like a tech product but can be Mm -hmm. a cake and then go out and test and see how the market reacts and so many great businesses start by word of mouth because word of mouth is free and so if you can get people excited about what you're doing and you're getting people calling you and you are seeing that there is some demand for the product that's a really great sign what happens so often and this is what I want to try to get people to avoid as they think about starting businesses for themselves is so many times uh, you see somebody who has a pretty good idea and they're excited about it and they show it to all their friends and their friends say, what a great idea. And then all of a sudden they've launched a business. They've gotten a loan or they've raised some money. They've invested. They're in it full time, but they've never really taken the time to figure out if the market is there for what they're doing, right. if what they're doing is special or different, or if people are excited about it. And as a result, um, you could end up to a point where you were doing something, but you never really get the traction to be able to do this as a full-time business. And so by testing it, getting it out into the world and seeing how people react to it, that right there will give you the data that you need to make a go or no-go decision. And the great thing about doing it on the side, I mean, listen, I understand when you're working full-time, it's, it's a, it's a hassle to be working on your nights and weekends, but you will, you'll understand this is a temporary thing that you're doing in order to make sure that your idea is a good one. How long do you think that that should be like so yes so i have i have a suggestion that i make on this one my rule is this get it out there into the world let it grow work on it um, maybe even bring a partner in because that makes it easier to actually get what you need done mm-hmm. see if if you have some traction and then and i'll give you a, a interesting case study um, to support this 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 thesis when you are at the point where you can see that you could live off of this product at a level that's acceptable to you, then go full time or bring in a partner who can help you get to that point. And you know, you won't, if you, for example, if you're just like, there's not enough hours in the day for me to figure this out, then it's time to look for help. There's a great case study that I I find really inspiring um, and that some of you may know uh, because it's it's a company that has become quite big on the East Coast and is now going national. And it's a company called Luke's Lobster. It's a, it's a, so I'm from the state of Maine and Luke. Yeah, sure. So you know lobster. Yeah. I know. I have a rule. If I don't eat it once a week, I'm not allowed to go back to visit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Luke was, is from the state of Maine. He's from Cape Elizabeth. He was living in New York City and he couldn't find a reasonably priced lobster roll because, you know, we pay like $18 in the state of Maine and in New York City, they serve them on fine China and charge $45. Right. 
And so he thought to himself, well, this doesn't make sense. And he uh, had some ties to the seafood industry. So he actually came up with the idea of doing a reasonably priced lobster roll and sourcing uh, fresh meat every day. And he put together a business plan. He studied it on his own. He talked to a lot of different people to figure out how much he should pay for rent and where should the store be and how what kind of demand there might be for a product like this. And he wrote a business plan. He went through a very sort of meticulous exercise of actually figuring out, okay, can I, what, you know, how much should I spend on these things? How much money do I need to raise? And, and how should I promote this? And what should the price be? And all these sorts of things and talking to people and just like almost like writing a report or a term paper right mm -hmm. and then he was working 60 or 70 hours a week on Wall Street so he couldn't be there during the day so he went to Craigslist and put an advertisement for a partner and he found a guy who is a really smart guy named Ben Ben Conniff and Ben had worked for um, some different culinary magazines and was passionate about the food industry and he made Ben his partner and Ben had the flexibility to be there during the day and they opened their first store and Ben scraped together $35,000 between he and his dad and the store paid back that investment in 17 days. Oh my God, 17 days, wow. Right? I mean, really? And what was interesting about that is so he, you know, he knew that there was something there, but he couldn't afford to quit his day job. And so he kept working full time on Wall Street for a year. Ben was working during the days and, and he was paying him a salary. And then when they opened their second store and they had enough cash flow, then he went and did it full time. But he was very patient. And I think that is the word that um, entrepreneurs don't like the word patient. Right? right, because you want to be successful right away. You want yep. you want to kill it, but yep. my approach is the, the, there is patience required, but it's so much more sustainable than jumping in full time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's awesome. How many stores does Luke have now? He has about twenty twenty five, wow. and he raised private equity from a big European private equity firm and is going mm -hmm. national. So you, uh, everybody will have a Luke's lobster within driving distance before wow. too long. Wow. Amazing. So in your book, you talk about playing to your strengths and you talked about it at the beginning when you talked about creating that bio. I think it's really important, but I think a lot of times people are not able to be that self-aware. Can you talk to me about what you talk about in that chapter? What does that mean playing to your strengths? How do you figure out what they are? And then how do you capitalize on them? Yeah, so the example that I give in that chapter, I think it's, it's also a really a creative example. Um, because when I wrote the book, I didn't want it just to be about doctors, lawyers, and bankers, because then people would be sleeping the whole time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And so the example I give is, and this is such a great example of playing to your strengths, because the the, the, the person that I write about is called the Pali Patwa. And the Pali is from India. She comes from Ahmedabad, India. and But she ended up getting a design fellowship and moving to the States and doing stuff with MoMA. And then she was working designing things like bedspreads and, and other things like that for, for home use. And so she was traveling back and forth between Asia and the U.S. and doing all these designs and all this other stuff. And then she had her first son. And her mom sent her some baby clothes from India. And she put them on Elon, her son. And people love them. And she thought to herself, this is kind of interesting. I have this design passion. I understand design. I love design. I'm from India. I'm a new mom. And I'm always spending all this time buying baby clothes online interesting like I have this unique perspective what if I were to take all this unique perspective and talent I had and develop a baby uh, and children's clothing line based around designs from India wow. so think about that and so she created a business called Masala Baby that does exactly that it's very successful she's now doing it full time yeah, I know who she is. I mean I didn't know her but I, I have three babies so I know the line it's oh amazing. well she's amazing and so yeah. What I love about her story, and when I when I sat down with her, it, you know, it's like it's, you just hear the story, and it's it's so obvious that what you want to think about doing, and what Dipali did, is she built a business that is so tied to who the essence of who she is, mm -hmm. and nobody can do it better than her. And and so as you think about, you know, everybody listening today, as you think about the kind of businesses, think about what's special and unique about you, and what gets you out of bed in the morning, and. It may not be that your entire business can be that, but if you can find a business that's related to the things that get you excited and mm -hmm. it's related to things that you're passionate about and that you're great at, 
that's where you want to be. That is what I, I call playing to your strength. It's the strike zone that is the, if you think of a Venn diagram, it's, you know, what are you good at? What do you love? And if you can find the intersection of those two things, like the poly did, you know, design, children, India, all of those things, they're what she's great at. And when she walks into a room, she is her company. In the same way, I, the example I love to give is Tory Burch. So Tory Burch built this amazing company. When you meet Tory Burch, not that I've had the pleasure, but maybe someday, she <laughs> is her company. Right. And so if you can find a business, like what you do, you're a musician, you've created this business that takes your talent and, and spreads it around the world. And when I, somebody talks to you or meets you, they can't imagine you doing anything else. That's really the end goal you're going for. And so spending the time doing the biography that I mentioned and thinking about what you would do if you could do anything you wanted the rest of your life, thinking about those things and right. talking with your friends and your family and your loved ones, yeah. those will help you hone in on those concepts. So speaking of honing in, like, let's say you're listening to this and, you know, let's pick another person. His name is making this up. His name is Peter and he is a ceramics artist and he knows what he loves. He know he loves doing ceramics and he's passionate about it and he's good at it. Mm. Um, but he's not sure what the very first thing is to do. Does he work on honing his craft? Does he test a few things, put up a few pictures of pots and see which one gets the most response? And then... My question in terms of being overwhelmed is just because early on we were talking and you were saying, I think really wisely, figure out how you can scale things up so you can make money when you're sleeping. If you're a person who needs to make these cakes or make these pots, how do you scale up a business like that? This is what I would start to do. I think one of the big the big messages of my book is you don't need to do this alone. And so what I would first think about is who would really value what I'm doing and respect it and connect with those people. For example, for Peter, I'm going to call him Pedro because okay. that's your, yeah, I because I'm a Latin Americanist. Right, so, right, right. And I think of Pablo Picasso, but <laughs> with Pedro, he's creating this art. What would be really fun and interesting for him to do that would be very low friction is find people who would value what he's doing and expose his work in ways that allow him to connect with a wider audience and start building a following. So for example, can he find people who have a gallery or a restaurant or somebody who's an Instagram, uh, sort of po posts art on Instagram as a yep. way to get his name out there and expose himself and start building a following? Because yep. that costs nothing, right? Yep. One thing I'll tell you, one other story I'd love to share with you that I, yeah, that I found really inspiring and very much relates to creative endeavors is uh, a woman named Joanna that I met through a friend of mine because she is an assistant at a consulting firm in London. And my buddy, I was having lunch with him over, over there and he said, you know, my, my assistant's a 10% entrepreneur and she's kind of amazing. You got to meet her. And I said, okay introduced me. So a couple of days later we had coffee and she, she's a quite an amazing woman. She liked candles and she, she really loved soy candles. And she was one day at some store and the soy candle was like 70 bucks. And she thought to herself, like, that's crazy. She ordered a candle making kit, taught herself oh how to make God. candles this at This is home. amazing. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. So then she learns how to make them because you know, it's, it's not, I, I would probably be terrible at it, but she had creative sort of ideas, and and then she basically uh, using the internet and hire, you know buying things online and freelancers and whatever created a brand and a design and a website, and she started selling these candles at fairs on the weekend. They're called Clement and Claude, and if you live in the UK, um, you can you can find them all kinds of places. She started selling them on the weekend, and then. She started to get busier and busier, and she convinced her employer to let her work one day a week from her garage in Wimbledon, where she makes these candles. Hmm. And so she did that. She would she needed to take deliveries and things and, and ship things off. And then she got a wholesale account and another and another. And one day she turned on the TV, and there was her candle on a national television advertisement. Oh, my God. Right? Oh. And now she's making more money on her candles than she does at her day job. Wow. And she still has her day job or no? She still has her day job. She sells candles there too. She likes her job. So she's, you know, eventually she may go and do that full time, but she has been very happy to be able to have her day job. And what a lot of people do in Joanna's situation, and I don't know if she's done this or not, is that they go on and they'll go to their employer and they'll say, listen, I've got this side business. It's really taking off and I, and I need more time for it. And you know what happens? 
many times, in fact, most of the times I've ever heard, the employer says, you know what, you're really an awesome employee. We don't want to lose you. How can we accommodate you? Would you like to work three days a week instead of five? And so that happens all the time. At that point, what would be the positive in staying in your day job if you're already making money? Wouldn't you want to just commit more energy to your craft? I think for a lot of people, when you're in that early period still and you've got some traction, but you're still, it's very, you know, on a monthly basis, it can be variable and all over the place. You just want that security of knowing that you still have something to go back to because a lot of people just don't want to jump in full time yet. And that means in that sense, it can still be something that's all positive as opposed to causing stress. It just becomes this hobby that you're making a lot of money at and having a lot of fun at. And then once it grows even more, I guess, secure, you could, you could take the leap. Exactly. And I think that idea, this was not possible 10 years ago, right? It was not possible until we had iPhones and things like that that allow us to run a business from our pocket. And so as a result, there are, these examples are not as, uh, I think there'll be many, many more in five years or 10 years, mm-hmm. but it allows you to bridge the gap from the comforts of the day job to the comforts of having a thriving business right. in a much more seamless way. Yeah, it does. What do you mean in chapter nine when you're talking about overcoming obstacles? What are the main things that you talk about there? Oh boy. So one of the big ones is imposter syndrome. Uh, let's talk about that. Oh, but- that's that. I, I have suffered that one. It's this idea. I, I go to some event. Maybe I go pitch an angel investment group because I want to raise money or yeah. I go to meet with a potential client and I think to myself, you know, these people must be thinking like, what the heck is this person doing here? Why them? Right. I love that you're saying this. You're getting to the heart of it. Like, honestly, this is it. I I didn't expect you to say that. Okay. So keep going. So how do you get over that feeling? So I I had been in a very comfortable, I had gone on Harvard business school. I worked in a big office on Park Avenue and I didn't worry about that because I had a business card with a brand on it that I could pass out. Right. Yeah. And then my first time when I started doing these things, I remember I, I was, as you know, I work with Latin America, so I flew to Brazil and I had my sad homemade moo.com business cards, which, <laughs> which are totally fine, but I was a little insecure about them. And then Delta lost my luggage. You're kidding. You're joking. <laughs> I'm totally serious. I got it back eventually, but it was... Oh, God. Uh, so I was wearing my clothes I'd been on the plane. I went to this meeting I looked like I basically stumbled out of, uh, you know, flight 237. I put my business cards down on the table and I just had, I thought to myself, what have I done? Like, why would these people keep me, take me seriously? And I remember feeling really dejected because I thought, you know, this is never going to happen for me. And I was um, at this conference where a lot of people where maybe a couple years ago, I would have been speaking on stage and here I was sitting on the side and nobody yeah, yeah. knew who I was. Sure. And then I just felt really dejected. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, this is all in your head. It really is. Like if you walked in there confidently and sold yourself, you would be fine. And in fact, one year later, I spoke at that very same conference. Um, And so I realized that was this, but it was about, I think a lot of these things, the reality is if you show up having spent time thinking about what your pitch is, if you bothered to make a halfway decent business card. And if you walk in and you look for ways to work with people, and especially if people actually sort of, and you have a rep, reasonable background that's connected to what you want to do, most people give you the benefit of the doubt and all these doubts are stuck in your own head and they're their own yeah. creation and you're your own worst enemy. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously you got over that, you wrote a book and you're taking on the world. How'd you get over that? You just kept doing it? or you Little by you? little, you yeah, just push yeah. every day. You get out of bed in the morning and you say, I'm doing this for a reason and some days really stink and some days are really great. It's much more like the ups and the, the highs and the lows are way different than working in a, you know, a job job. But what I think you need to do is back to the P word. And I, I you know, I don't love patience. I'm not a particularly patient person, but it's, um, yeah, right. It's somebody gave me some really good advice when my book came out that I think r- really applies to this. And it's, um, her name's Amy Whitaker. Um, Mm -hmm. she wrote a book called art thinking and she said to me, when you write a book, you think your life's going to change overnight and it doesn't and you get depressed. Yeah. But if you wait one year and you look back, you'll see all the things that you've done. Love that. Right. Isn't that cool? I was sort of, and at the time I was like, I just, book had just come out and I was sort of in like, sort of like a postpartum 
thing yeah. where I was like, I oh, I put all this mm-hmm. energy into it and now what? And she was totally right. Yeah, I totally get that. Um, what's one of the op- other obstacles you talk about in the book coming? FOMO and FOBO, fear of missing out and fear of a better option. Now, didn't you coin that phrase? Is that crazy? Did yeah, you really coin that? I really did. How did that, how does that even, what does that even mean? People say that all the time. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so FOMO is fear of missing out and it's become, it's in the Oxford Dictionary. Oh my God. So it's a term that I came up with when I was at Harvard Business School because you know, I'm from a small town in Maine. There is, you have no fear of missing out because not that much happens. Oh my right? God, I can't believe you made this. This is like <laughs> your coolest invention. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, it's, yeah. And, you know, and, and so basically I noticed everybody running around trying to do everything all the time. And I thought to myself, this is very weird. And so I wrote an article in our school newspaper called McGinnis's Two Foes. FOMO and FOBO. And FOBO, unlike FOMO, is the fear of a better option. It's the idea that um, you don't want to commit because you think something better is going to come along. So it's like, oh, you know, thank you so much for your invitation to your birthday party. Let me just get back to you three minutes before it starts. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm sure you live in LA. Like, that's, oh, yeah. that's yeah. that happens. And so um, as a result, I have noticed a lot in the entrepreneurial world, the professional world, that these things are dominant today. FOMO is a big one, right? If you aren't happy in your job or what you're doing, you go on a Facebook at the end of the day or LinkedIn or whatever you do for your social media and you see what your friends are doing and you think to yourself, like, my life is passing me by. I'm I'm not achieved anything. But the problem with that, the problem with that is that you are fundamentally going to lose if you let that take over your life because nobody can do everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so... What I think the way to beat that, and, and it's you know easier said than done, but what I have noticed is, for example, if you, if you are Susie or Pedro and you have this passion and you know that you're meant to be doing it, just start. Just begin. Because the minute you are creating momentum in your own life and something you care about, the FOMO is gone. I have lived that. It's so true. And do I need to know step 15 before I start? What if I don't have it all together? How do I start? Yeah, for me, uh, it goes down to starting small with digestible things you can actually do. Mm-hmm. For example, the idea of creating a piece for the pottery business or something, creating that right. one or two pieces and getting them out into the world. It's it's like uh, you know any creative endeavor. You can create a million things in your garage, but until you put them into the world and see how the world reacts to them right. and then understand how you can then do more of those things, mm-hmm. uh, until you do that, it's going to be really hard to move forward. So I, what I always, you know, yeah. with, it's like, you know, writing a book or writing a song, anything else. It's about putting it out there and seeing what the world does with it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just beginning. Yes. The last thing you talk about in the book is winning the long game. What do you mean by that? So what I mean by that is uh, this is a lifestyle. The idea of doing a 10% entrepreneur project or any of the things we've been talking about is not, it's not a six month thing. It's not a three month thing. It's really a way of living your life and it's something that you will do forever. And so the, um, one of the, the, the stories that I really inspired me in the book was about a guy who has done like hundreds of these things and he will, he's been doing them for 50 years. And a wow. lot of the things he's done have been really cool. Like he invested in PJ Clark's, the restaurant chain, and he's investor now in a, in a minor league baseball team and all these kinds of cool things. And, mm-hmm. and that's what he likes his day job. He's, he, he could afford, he's a, a, a very successful guy. He could afford to not do that, um, not have a day job, but he loves his job. But what he's known for and what gets him out of bed in the morning is these types of things. And what's so cool about that is that he'll never retire. I think the idea of sort of retiring and, and, you know, sort of hanging out for 20 or 30 years, uh, that's so, like, that only exists in retirement commercials now. Right. Right? Right, Exactly, yeah. I don't want to ever retire, but what I do want to do is spend all of my time on things that are really exciting to me. And so the long game, the way I think about it, is this idea of creating something that's yours that you will take everywhere you go till, you know, the very last days of your life. Oh, that's beautiful. When you look back, I mean, you had so much to say that was so relevant and so helpful and so like big picture and small picture and how to get from where you are to where you want to go. If someone is going to take away one thing from this, what's the one thing that you think is the most important thing to go ahead and do today after you listen to this episode? I think the most important thing to do is think about how you can be an owner of something 
beyond sort of just yourself? How can you take your talent, your creative talent, your baking talent, whatever it is that you feel passionate about, whatever it's driving you to listen to this podcast, how can you create something that is that's more than just freelancing, but that you're an owner of? Because that is how you create something that's scalable that you can really eventually do full time and that won't be a prison that will entrap you with feeling like you always have to be on the treadmill, but actually right. you can build into something that's meaningful and can involve lots more people. And those are like the examples you gave us of Masala Baby Clothing and Joanna with the soy candles and they created a business. Yes. So as far as that, the first thing to be doing, would it be honing your craft, putting your work out there, trying stuff, finding someone to work with on a team? What do you think is the first order of business? I think the number one thing you can do, and we didn't talk about this, but this is a whole other chapter of the book, is getting great people around you who can give you great advice. So we're here giving you advice right now, and um, but we, you can't take us home with you necessarily. Right. We're in your right. pocket right now, maybe. But there's all kinds of people in your community, in your life that you know that have different skills than you and that have potentially business skills or other skills that could be really valuable to you, that could help you think through these challenges. And when you're not alone, it's so much easier. So one of the early things you might want to do is think about people that could be um, advisors to you and help you think through um, and keep you honest and help you to stick to your plan. And as you do that, you know, it's like anything that you want to do when you have more people around you, you know, more hands make sort of lighter work. Yeah, that's true. And so would you reach out to just like friends of family or somebody on Facebook who runs a group or take a course? Just all of the above, like just all try to find above. people. So there's a couple ways to do it. What I like to do, so I've done a bunch of this and I've gotten over, I used to be shy, remember the imposter syndrome. Right. I've gotten over that. One thing I've learned that's kind of interesting is people like helping other people, entrepreneurs especially. The world of entrepreneurship is a pretty open place where people have struggled to get where they are and as a res- they remember. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nice. And so when you call them up, they're like, okay, I'm willing to help you. Right. As long as you use their time respectfully and you've got your ducks in line. Yeah. So I would think carefully about what you need for help and ask and be organized about it and use people's time really wisely and then figure out five people, either people, you know, or maybe people you don't even know yet and approach them. Maybe you see them at a conference. Maybe people ask me all the time for help. I'm very happy to sit down and talk to them. It may not be I'm going to you know, join their company, but if they need my help in a half an hour of my time, I'm really happy to do it. But I can tell you if they ask for my time and then they cancel on me or they don't show up, uh-huh. that's yeah. it. This is my, my thinking in terms of all of this. Let's say, um, this is the last example of this, but let's say my name is Katie and I'm a blogger and I want to create a big blog that talks about traveling and I want to get people interested. Is the most important person to learn from somebody who is really good at Facebook ads or is the most important thing just to genuinely be passionate and make an incredible product? And if the writing is good or my ceramics are good or my food is good, eventually it's going to grow or do I really need to focus more on uh, what I'm posting and social media or is it both? Well, I think if you have a terrible product, you may be able to use all these tax and tricks to be able to make some money and be successful. But it's much harder. I think it starts with having a great product. I would never encourage anybody to believe that you can get away with a product that's not amazing and that you can't Mm -hmm. feel proud of. So I think if you're bothered, if you're going to do this, do it right and do something um, that you feel really proud of and that you think is great. But the next step is build it and you will come is not necessarily true. You can build an amazing thing. You can write an amazing book or write an amazing song and nobody will ever hear that song or show up to your game. My brother is a musician. I remember in the early days, he'd have like four people at his gigs, right? Yeah, yeah. And thank God now he's doing really well. But in the beginning, um, it it wasn't enough to have a great product. You know, it took him many, many years. So think about that. Okay, I got a great product when I believe in my product, what are the ways that I can really expose people to that? And so that's when you start bringing in, you know, the Facebook person or somebody who can help you with AdWords and things like that. And I think what the critical part is, what it connects us all as you think about it is thinking about what it will take to make this a profitable business, how much investment that will require. And if this business is successful, what could actually look like? Because if you, what would be terrible is to go into something having not done your homework and think, oh, I could live off of this. And then realize like, for example, Instagram celebrity, okay? 
So you think, okay, somebody's got 100,000 Instagram followers. They could be really rich and live off that, and you know, it's a business. The reality is I've read some articles. Like when you have 100,000 followers, you probably make you know, $500 a month. So right. you cannot live off that. I mean, most people. Um, right. And so as a result, if you knew that going in, you'd probably approach a different sort of strategy. And you're saying $500 a month from what, affiliate fees? Because you could use that um, 100,000 following to sell something to them, like your ceramics or your paintings or something. That would be a totally You could different. do that for sure. But these are people who sort of like want to just get like, you know, fees from restaurants or whatever yeah, to take no, pictures no, no, or no. stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear that. Yeah. So you could turn something else for sure. The last thing I'm thinking, because you've said it a few times, and you went to Harvard Business School, you're really, really bright, and you've worked in the financial industry, but what about people, you know, when you're saying, you know, look at it and analyze it, there's a lot of people who, they don't know how to analyze things, and that would be really overwhelming. Like, how do mm -hmm. I how do I understand whether or not this is a good thing, or this is going to make sense, if I don't know how to do a spreadsheet? You know, what are some basic things I can do so that that doesn't feel so overwhelming? Absolutely. Well, one thing I wanted to do, well, I, I was really focused and, and I really cognizant of the fact that some people might pick up this book and read my bio and say, well, thank you, Mr. Harvard MBA, but yeah. I don't have that or I haven't worked in finance. And so your right. book is not going to apply to me. And right. I and I didn't want that to happen. And so that's why I include uh, stories of dozens of people on four, con uh, four continents, 10 countries who are in all kinds of different industries, because I wanted to make sure that there were examples of people who had never done a spreadsheet who were successful as entrepreneurs. Right. Right. So that was that was really critical and, and, and that comes through in the book. But I would say what is really important to remember is nobody can do everything well. So for example, I can do spreadsheets, but I am terrible at lots of other things. And so I go out and find other people to help me because even if you can't do these things, and this comes back to building that team of people, finding somebody, these things are, they, when you don't know how to build a spreadsheet, it looks like it's super, super, super hard. It's not that hard. There's lots of people who can do that. It doesn't take right. a ton of work and they could even teach you to do it. Right. But getting people to help you out in the areas where you don't have the skills yet yeah. really makes a difference. Yep. So the, the one other thing I want to ask you before we wrap up, because we didn't, we didn't really talk about it so much, and I think it's a good place to end with the sort of how-to because it's a place where people can begin. You talk about making the most of your time and your money. That's one of your chapters. And people are now being encouraged as we t went through this interview to start where they are and spend a little bit of time while they're at their job or, or not, but just to spend a little bit of time. But what if they, they have a really busy life? They've got a day job. They've got kids. How are you going to make the most of your time and money? Yeah, so the the time question is one that is a lot of people ask me and a lot of people struggle with and I do too. I totally understand. The there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Number 1 is technology makes it so much easier to do lots of things at once. So, I have a, a story of in the book of one woman who has three children under the age of 4 yep. who used carpool to do all of her conference calls. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, right? it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and she's a good driver, so it's all good, but Using time for more than one purpose. So, for example, if you are uh, walking down the street, you know, New York City. Every time I go anywhere, I'm on the phone doing something else. Or right. when I uh, when I go to the gym, I listen to podcasts that help sure. me think about business yeah. ideas. So, yeah. repurposing yeah. time for multiple reasons um, can be very helpful. Second thing is just cutting out things that don't matter to you. I don't have cable. Yep. I got rid of it because I realized that I was wasting a ton of time. Yeah, I get that. And then the third thing that you can do is find projects in which you can work with people that you love and enjoy spending time with. Because then, like for example, my best friend and I have a bunch of projects together. And so we talk all the time. We were talking all the time anyway. Now we can use right. part of that time yeah, to nice. talk about our business opportunities. That's nice. Okay, last question. What is the best piece of advice you were ever given? Whew. Uh, is, okay, so here's a story. So when I was in college, I backpacked from Bogota to Colombia to Cartagena on the coast. And this was during the Colombian, the dark days of the Colombian Civil War and left this bus. It was supposed to be 12 hours, ended up being 26 hours. Oh the God. air conditioning broke an hour two. The toilets broke reasonably soon after that. Oh God. There were dogs running around. It was, and then we got stopped by a strike and there were these protesters and oh a car tried to go through and the car, people jumped on the car and broke all the windows. And, oh God. and so then when the, the strike was finally done, we'd been on the road for over 24 hours and I had one meal. Oh my God. That's um, exhausting. And um, the bus wouldn't start. And so 
we, they asked all the men to get off the bus and push. And I remember, <gasps> which is, you know, which was shocking, right? Because, you know, I've never seen that before. And, uh, I, you know, you're walking down the aisle. The bathroom contents are all over. It was really bad. Oh, my God. And, and so I said to my friend next to me in Spanish, I said, I cannot believe this. And a woman, there was this woman who was dressed in her Sunday best for this trip. I mean, she looked, you know, she had like a business suit on almost. And she was an older woman. And she looked at me and she said, live it and believe it. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, that woman, I was kind of like, wow, I can't believe she called me out. But then I thought to myself, that's actually a really good way to live your life. What does she mean by that? How did you interpret that? What I interpreted is you are in a moment you got to just believe what's going on, accept it, and then just live with it. Go with the flow, push forward. You've just, basically, it's like, you're going to have a lot of th things thrown at you in life. Yeah. That is, that's, that's neat. You know, no matter who you are, there will be things thrown at you. You yeah. got to just keep going forward, keep pushing. And that's, as an entrepreneur, um, I think that's really, really valuable advice. Yeah, love it. All right, so Patrick, where can people find you? Where do you want to send them to? So you can find me at my website, patrickmcginnis.com. It's M-C-G-I-N-N-I-S. And there, actually, you can download a lot of the exercises in the book. I've created a free ebook. So if you go to patrickmcginnis.com slash build your 10, mm -hmm. you can download those. Um, you can also find me, if you go to the site, you can click through to Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. And we have all kinds of great content on the blog. And then the book is available at your local Barnes and Noble at Amazon. It's on audible.com. Mm -hmm. um, so you will not have any trouble finding me. Awesome. And they can listen to it for free. If they go to audible.com slash dream job, they can download your book for free. I love um, that. I love that too. Well, this was really, really insightful. You know, you may be coming out of Harvard Business School and Wall Street, but you get people and you get creative people. Um, you can tell that you really love um, helping people do the things that they're passionate about. And I love that you've married your ability to see sort of big picture and help those, you know, who really have beauty to give to the world. You're helping them to do that. So thank you for for being on. Thank you and good luck to everybody with your 10%. Awesome. Such a great interview. I felt like it was so practical and I loved having you here. So here are some of my takeaways. Number one, do something that's sustainable and diversified, gets you excited and makes you proud to do it. Number two, this is a lifestyle. Create something that you can take everywhere you go until the last day of your life. Number three, before jumping all in, test your idea first, see how the market reacts to it. Number four, surround yourself with people who can give you good advice and keep you accountable to your plan. Number five, you don't have to work alone. Nobody can do everything so well. Number six, repurpose your time and cut out things that don't matter to you. And number seven, live it and believe it. All right, well, that's all for us this week. Um, stay tuned. We've got great people coming on the show. Bobby Brown's going to be here. She's an amazing makeup artist, as most of you know. Um, we have a visual artist coming up. We have so many other cool things happening. So stay tuned and please leave us a review on iTunes. Please share the show with your friends. Post about it on Facebook. Post about it on Instagram. Tweet about it. You can follow me on Twitter at Kathy Heller. You can follow me on Instagram at Kathy.Heller. And I look forward to continuing to watch you guys go for what you want and follow your bliss. Go to nodayjobs.com and sign up to find out how you two can be on the show and I will interview you and talk about what creative pursuit you're up to. Have a great day, guys. I want to give a shout out to the amazing team who makes this show possible. Special thanks to our executive producer, Tim Street and producer, Emma Kikuchi. The podcast is a production of Authentic. For more info on advertising in this show, visit AuthenticShows.com.